This is Spencer with The MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Jeff Nichols, writer and director of Midnight Special, many other films you've enjoyed. Um, This is the story of a family sort of reconvening together after sort of life has fractured them and is sort of brought together under uh, supernatural circumstances, I guess is the best way to put it without spoiling it, because you definitely don't want it to be spoiled. Um, I want to start by talking about sort of the notion of family. I read that this film was inspired by you becoming a father. Um, what, what, how, how did becoming a father sort of change your perspective, and how did that sort of lead you to sort of the idea behind this film, I guess? Yeah, you know, when I write, uh, I typically write on two tracks. Uh, there are things with plot and genre and character, and those, those things are kind of developing uh, in the background. But I always try at some point to attach things to my life, to an emotion in my life that's very palpable, because making movies is kind of like a gauntlet. <clears throat> and if my declared kind of goal as a filmmaker is to transfer an emotion to the audience by the end of the film, um, I have to find one that's really pretty severe. Um, something that at any point in the writing or the directing or the editing, I can kind of drop back in and check it in on and still feel it. And for this film, you know, I was pretty well along into this sci-fi chase movie idea and these characters on the road and this boy with special powers and all this stuff was going on. And, and I just had to kind of pump the brakes and say like, well, okay, all that's well and good, but what the hell does it mean? And um, and that's when I started looking at my, my own life. And, you know, I was in my first year of fatherhood, and my son was about eight months old, and he had a, a febrile seizure, which wow. is um, the body's reaction to a spike in fever. It actually happens to apparently like one in a thousand kids. They grow out of it by the time they're five. They're no long-lasting effects. But my wife and I didn't know that. And, um, and we, were, we were shocked by it. We were terrified by it. And... It really started to make me think about, you know, what am I doing as a parent? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. and and that directly started to become the question at the center of the film. Um, Mike Shannon's character is a father who's trying desperately to figure out what his son needs to be healthy, mm-hmm. to survive, to be happy, um, and ultimately, you know, to separate from him. And that seemed like a, a very potent emotion to start to work on and kind of what I realized as a as a parent through all this is that you know we have no real control over our kids uh, we can't control whether they they're safe or not not really um, we can't control who they become so what are we here to do and, and it makes sense that as a parent you're just there to to try to find what your child is mm. to find it for them to find it for yourself not project yourself onto them um, what you want from them, but just really find out the nature of them and help them understand that so that by the time they do leave, which they will, they are secure in themselves and they know what they are. Um, and that's what that's what Mike Shannon's character is trying to do in this movie. That's what Kirsten Dunst's character mm-hmm. is trying to do mm-hmm. in this movie. Yeah, I can totally and that kind of became the really the, the core uh, of this story. I mean, you talked a lot about sort of the genesis of this film. I mean, in it. Over the years, you've been sort of considered for other things, obviously, since you were working on Warner Brothers, you know, the Justice League universe, I guess you were considered for Aquaman. Is it some? Is that an element of you as a filmmaker that you really have to have sort of that personal connection to the material, a certain level of understanding that makes you want to continue to sort of grow your own stuff up from the ground? Or is, is, there, is there an element that you would be willing to consider other people's works? Because it seems like there's a very personal touch to a lot of the movies you made so far. That And maybe, and maybe that's one of the reasons that makes them so good. Uh, is that something you really think about? Or is it not even in the back of your head? You just have these ideas currently, and you're like, I'm going to run with the ideas I have until somebody else comes up with a better idea to replace them. No, I, I definitely think about it. And... Um I don't really know how anybody can work on a film for three or four years, which is what it takes, and not be personally invested in it somehow. Um, Like beyond just financially invested in it. Obviously lots of people do it, um, but I don't know how. I just think I would be unhappy. Oh no, I don't. Um, I think I would be an unhappy person. My wife and I have several times looked at my email and looked at a number 
and looked at an offer <laughs> and, and said, wow, that would be cool. Um, we could get an in-ground pool, <laughs> which I've always considered to be the... That's a good mark for success. The pinnacle yeah. of success. And, um, and inevitably, I, I had a really good partner in that. She said, nah, you know, you'd hate yourself doing that. Well, you have no relationship to that. Um, so that seems to be the guiding principle. Now, you know, my next film, Loving, it's based on a true story. It's mm -hmm. not about my life. It's about somebody else's life. But there was something in it that I did, identified with so kind of potently that it made the cut. <clears throat> so anything's possible, but it, it does. It has to be built correctly. Um, and, and I think if, it, if it's something I can feel emotional about, something that, again, I can drop into at any time and, and really feel, um, then it has a good shot of, of, of getting made. Yeah. Very cool. One of my favorite parts, I, and I can't speak for everyone, but one of my favorite parts of your work has been the use of location as a character. Um, what has your process been in terms of thinking about that? Because, I, I mean, definitely in this film, it's a huge character in itself, especially with the context of the story. Um, but is that something that you actively sort of imagine as you're writing these stories? Or yes. is it something that organically comes to be as you're sort of location scouting and stuff? Because it's, it, is, it is a really strong element of the ambiance, the scene, and it makes a really powerful sort of presence in your films. Yeah, this stuff is kind of baked in um, when I write it from the beginning. <clears throat> you know, I know these places that I write about. If I didn't know a place, then I have to go see it and learn about it mm -hmm. to write about it. Uh, but that's why the majority of my stuff takes place in the American South, is because that's that's where I've grown up. Now, I've been living in Texas the last decade, and lo and behold, part of this movie takes place in Texas. Yes. And it, it, it's no mistake. Um, I think... To write really quality stuff, you have to get real specific. Um, I think that detail is where the power comes uh, on the page. Mm -hmm. And and it's what gets you through the process of filmmaking when you have a million people coming up to you asking you questions, which is what directing is. You don't actually do anything yourself. You just try and transfer information to people as clearly as possible. So when a million questions are being thrown your way. You have to have real answers. You know, you have to have an idea in your mind of what you want. Yeah. You really do. And um, and for better or worse, I have a very clear idea of what I want. Now, it makes the location manager's job very hard. You know, uh, <laughs> our first day of shooting um, was part of the first scene where they walk out of this motel room, mm -hmm. and we drove three hours into Mississippi, three hours away from New Orleans, to shoot that uh, that motel. Now, there are plenty of motels by highways closer than that, but I just had a very specific idea, and it's not just about the look of the doors or something. It, it, it's more specific than that. It, it really is, I had the shot in my mind designed, where it would begin, how it would rotate, the proximity of the characters to the front desk clerk, and where that front desk clerk mm -hmm. could see them, her line of sight, and the reveal of an interstate next to the freeway that had a look that could be Texarkana, that looked like it could have these kind of tall pine trees and be and be a big interstate, not a, not a highway, not a two-lane highway, not a, you know, a road is not a road is not a road. You know? <laughs> like, it couldn't be a parkway, it couldn't be, uh, you know, a state highway, it had to be, um, it had to be an interstate, because those are built a certain way, they look a certain way. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, again, the specificity, uh, the devil's in the details, you know, and, and I think it all adds up to a to a bigger thought by the time you watch the movie. I, I definitely think that sort of attention to detail comes through. I mean, there are definitely, you can tell films where they <laughs> don't give a shit at all, whether there's like any sort of practical, logical reality to the sure. film at all. Um, so I definitely can appreciate that detail. Um, obviously, one obvious note, I guess, not to repeat, the word too many times is uh, your work with Michael Shannon in this movie. Obviously, you've worked with him several times before. What is it about your sort of collaboration with him that has been particularly successful? Is it he's just sort of the same sort of passionate way about stories and film as you, or what is it about him that you've really been able to connect on beyond just a purely you know functional actor director level? 
it's funny because I don't talk to him a lot about what I'm doing. You know, it's not like I call him and say, okay, I'm writing another movie about fatherhood for you. Um, and maybe this is uh, something I take for granted, but I, I just call it, I always just know he's going to be there for me, you know, and luckily he has been. When I've called, he's come, and that makes me one of the luckiest directors in the world um, because my channel is one of the greatest actors in the world. Um, but just being on this press tour with him and hearing him speak, I mean, I should let him speak for himself, but, <laughs> but I think he feels like the things that I write line up with some of the thoughts that he's having. Mm. I know that was the case for Take Shelter. I think we were both... Oddly enough, at that point in our lives, he was a new father. I was about to become a father. I think we were kind of freaked out about the environment and the economy. And, yeah. You know, we're, we're starting to bring new new people into this world, and, and what the hell is going on? Yeah. We were freaked out about it. And what's interesting is, again, we didn't talk about that. Uh, we, it's not like we, we sat and had a beer and we're like, man, isn't the world messed up? We should make a movie about that. I was feeling something uh, very deeply. I shared it with him. And he saw something in it and, and related to it. Kind of appropriate for this film. You sort of have some sort of psychic bond, psychic <laughs> mental right. connection. Yeah, I don't know. I, I believe very firmly in a collective unconscious. Um, one other interesting thing that you've sort of touched upon is working with younger actors. You've made a lot of um, really interesting young actors in your films. One of the classic sayings in Hollywood is don't act, don't use kids or animals. Right. What has it made you sort of fearless to that? And is it challenging to find those young actors who sort of can do what you want from them? Or is that something that you've just been able to never really have problems with? I mean, it is challenging. It is a gamble. Um, but I've been really lucky. Uh, but we've also, just like those locations, you just keep looking until you find them. And you have to know what you're looking for, just like those locations. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be really specific about what you need. And, you know, with Jaden in this particular case, I knew I needed a boy who was aware, aware of his place in a situation. Uh, you know, there are lots of kids, most kids, hopefully, they aren't that aware. They're just bouncing off the walls. Yeah. And, you know, um, they're just kind of concerned with themselves and what they want in that moment. Um, <laughs> And that's what most kids should be. But this boy in this movie is unique. <clears throat> and there is a point where he becomes painfully aware of his place in the universe. Mm -hmm. And when you meet Jaden, he has that trait. It's a personality trait. It's not an act. It's not something he's trying to put on for you um, to impress you. Um, it's baked into his personality. And I think as a director, when you meet these kids... What you're trying to do is hold in your mind that character trait that's so important that's going to define this character and try and find that inside a person. Hmm. I mean, it honestly works for adults as well. I mean, I thought Joel Edgerton, uh, like, he's a guy you want to be friends with. Like, you want him to be your... I'd say that's a fair assessment. You yeah. want him to be your running buddy. Yeah. And, and, I, and I felt that from watching Warrior. I felt that from mm -hmm. watching Animal mm -hmm. Kingdom, you know? Yeah. Like that's, and, and I certainly felt it when I met him. And it just, it felt right, you know? Because I remember there were some other actors' names that came up on that list, which I won't mention. But it's like, I, I just kind of was like, yeah, but I don't want to... Like, I like that person for this part, or I like, you know... Mm -hmm. But that person doesn't seem like somebody I want as my wingman, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and so it applies to adult actors as well. You just really need to know your characters and know that, that, know that trait that you're looking for. Very cool. Uh... One last question I want to talk about, and this is a sort of a more generalized uh, film question. I saw recently you talked about the notion of HDTV and the presentation of films and stuff like that. What would you like to see in terms of that? Obviously, I mean, you talked about, you know, frame rate or refresh rates, frame rates, all that sort of stuff, and how that's affecting how people are, are sort of experiencing films. What would you like to see as a director sort of in terms of standardizations or sort of what do you think would best sort of translate that theatrical experience to a Individual well, nothing home. will translate the theatrical experience, but to the best of its there, ability, I guess. there should be some you know standard practices, right? Um, and it just seems very simple to me. It seems very clear to me. I'm not an engineer, so I don't have to work it out. But somebody should. Um, it makes very much sense to me that that 
these digital signals that we're sending out. You know, when you have a digital copy of your film, or mm -hmm. you have a TV show, or you have a sports program, that it would have a digital signature on it that your TV would pick up on, and it would change the settings according to what that digital signature is. Now, of course, people can override those if they want. And they want if they want everything to look like a bad soap opera, then yeah, sure, jack up the progressive frame rate. You know, go to town. You can make you can make my movie look like crap if you want to. But I think there's so many people that don't think about that. No. I think they go to Best Buy, they spend two grand on a TV, and they expect to turn it on and it be awesome. And a lot of people, I think, at first, because they don't know any better, they turn it on and they do think it looks awesome because it's just different. Wow, doesn't that look really sharp and weird? Yeah, turn up the brightness. That's not what it's supposed like that, to look like, yeah. you know? And it makes sense to me if I can drive around in my car with satellite radio and it can beam in, you know, the artist's name and the song title, why when, you know, my film plays through a Blu-ray or plays through um, your cable box or your Apple TV, why can't there be a signature imprinted on it that tells your TV how to make it look? And then, again, you can override that if you want, but at least you'll know what the filmmaker was thinking, you know? It just... It seems, it seems very simple to me, and and I don't understand why people, especially filmmakers, aren't asking for it more loudly. Well, I, it, is, it is an interesting point since there's so much going on, especially with like Netflix and HBO Go and all those sort of things sure. rising up that it would seem like a perfect time. It just seems, you know, like if the rating is baked in, like why can't why can't this detail be baked in? This thing that we spend as an industry so much time and energy in. You know, I spend so much money um, sitting in a DI suite, so much time, and it's very important. I sit there with my cinematographer. Yeah. Like, this is something we've been planning from the beginning. It's what Lucas wanted to do with THX in theaters, and I think that was a very good idea. So now let's have that, let's have that in our homes because, let's face it, this isn't going anywhere. You know, people are going to be watching these films in their homes, yeah. obviously. So instead of trying to deny that and just get everybody to the theater... Let's let's first start to try and tackle. Well, okay, here's some standardization for when you sit down on your couch. Very cool. So the film is Midnight Special. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff Nichols. I uh, can't wait to see. Was it Loving? It's coming out in November this year, isn't yeah, it? November okay. So very cool. Can't wait to see that when it comes out. And thank right. you so much for this time. Thank you.